Welcome to Golden City Alliance Fellowship. We are so glad that you could join us today. And uh, as we listen to His Word, may God speak in your life, in whatever circumstance that you are in right now. May He give us the hope, may He lift us up and encourage us every time as we listen to His Word. So our text for this morning is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 17. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am. And Simon Peter answered, You are the, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Simon Barjona, blessed are you because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Today, we have this confusion still of who is Jesus really. We, 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 we have people who still think that Jesus is this, he, he's a, a, this God who will just give us uh, therapy, meaning he just helps us uh, cope with life's problems. He heals our past. He, he will only tell us how valuable we are and that we should not be so hard on ourselves. And, and there's also an understanding of Jesus that He is this chill person, that He just likes to drink expensive coffee. He loves to have spiritual conversations with people and that He's open-minded. See, he, he accepts anybody and everybody and it doesn't matter what and how they live life. It's okay. And there's also this Jesus that would help you succeed in life. In all, you know, he, he'll make you perform better. He'll make you uh, jump higher. And there's also this gentle Jesus who's so meek and mild, will never hurt a fly with this uh, flowing hair. And, and there's also this uh, yuppie Jesus wherein he'll help you succeed in your in your. Uh, endeavor, he'll establish your business, and you will retire by your age 30. And there's also this uh, version of Jesus that he's a revolutionary, right? Uh, the one that will challenge status quo, that will put a stop to a corrupt system. And there's this, just this life coach Jesus, this Jesus that will now be just a wise, inspirational teacher who will keep on believing in you and help you find your center. And so, there's a lot of people that have different ideas of who Jesus is. And by having the, them having this uh, different understanding, this different notion of who Jesus is, they have this different idea now, let's say for example, of what he does. Let's say for example of being blessed. One of the most popular exp uh, ways we say farewell is to say, God bless you, right? God bless. Let, when you say goodbye, you say, uh, we'll meet again next week. You use it in your, in your communic text. You, you, you say it in your uh, social media. God bless, guys. Or I'm so blessed this morning. I'm so blessed today. What do you mean? What do we mean when we say, I'm blessed? And I say, it, it depends on who you or how you understand who Jesus is. And this is how it would mean when you say, we're blessed or I'm blessed. You see, if the way the world would understand being blessed is this that it's about having 
material and relational and positional success. That's, that's being blessed. That I would have this job, I would have this car, I would have this, this, this house, I would have this relationship, I would have this beautiful uh, vacation. I'm blessed. So, but is that being blessed in accordance or in accordance to the Word of God? Because if I look and listen, and if you have been journeying with us here in the past few months, we've started with Matthew chapter 5, and that Matthew chapter 5 is the Sermon of the Mount, and here Jesus teaches us about being blessed. That blessed are we if we are poor in spirit. Blessed are we if we are hurt, attacked, persecuted because of our of us following Jesus Christ. It doesn't seem now to fit with having this only this idea that the blessed life or being blessed is if we have positive gains, the positive gains of, uh, of life and positions. So for a, for a believer of Jesus Christ, the good life, the good blessed life is not and should never be based on having financial gains or, or reputation gains and all the gains in this world. Those are wonderful things, but never the basis of being blessed. So what is, and how should we then understand blessed? If you look at the Greek word, blessed there means makaroi, which means to be fully satisfied. And so being blessed in, in, in the understanding of the Bible is that it means that when we are blessed, we, are, we become satisfied fully by receiving a favor or the favor of God. Regardless of your circumstance. And so, what is then being blessed by God? One short answer would be this. Anything, anything that will be from the Lord that He gives you that will draw you closer to Jesus is a blessing. So when, when I would now say, God bless you, I mean that may God give you and draw you closer to Him. And I would not normally mean you being blessed with money because we know money can be a distraction. Money can help or be a source of, you know, if you love money, then all bad things comes with it. So I, I, I pray that we would have this understanding of, of now being blessed, and that's why today's sermon, I call it, Blessed are those who recognize Him. What's happening in this story is in, in, that in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is now focusing more on His disciples rather than the huge crowds that were following Him. And he's been teaching his disciples of who he is, what his mission is, and what they're going to be doing later on. He's, he's been telling them, exposing them in different ministries. He has sent them out in OJT uh, on the job training already. He's been correcting them, rebuking them. He's been very gentle and, and just teaching them of a what his mission is about and what the kingdom is all about. And now he asks this question. And Matthew 
chapter 16 is, is so important for you and me today is because we have to know the answer to the, this two questions or this one question that Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? See, this is no longer what your parents think who Jesus is or who your friends know about Jesus or what your friends know about Jesus. This is who you personally, you have to know the, the answer, this precious truth of who is Jesus to you personally. And this answer is for your sake, not for Jesus' sake, but for you and your soul's sake. And so, when Jesus asks this question, he's traveling with his disciples in a region dominated by unbelievers. He says, well, we've been here for a while now. I've been in the ministry for two years. We've done miracles. We've been teaching. And, and the, the, the region has benefited tremendously in the earthly ministry of Jesus. And he says now to his disciples, go around, ask around, ask if they know by now who I am. And so his disciples go around, they ask people, hey, do you know th th this rabbi that you've been following? Hey, do you know this, this Jesus who has healed you and you, that you, you maybe received bread from? And, and so they receive all these answers and they go back to Jesus. And, and when they go back to Jesus, they, they give the report. You know what, Jesus? Some people are saying that you are John the Baptist. And you could, you could really, you know, scratch your head. Why would, why would people mistake Jesus to be John the Baptist? They don't have the same name. <laughs> See, and, and uh, it reminds me of uh, maybe an experience I had going to the mall. Like, and there, there's this activity center usually at the, at the center of the mall, right? And I, I'm looking if there's a, a huge activi uh, an activity there. There's a, a, a local celebrity that would come, you know, and, and perform. I would usually find the malls filled at the center, at the activity center. There were just this huge crowd of people gathered around and watching this celebrity performing. And, and what I would do if I get curious about it is, is I, I'd also look. And, and when I look, and if I'm with my wife, and my, my wife would ask me, do you know, do you know that person? And I said, uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, don't, I, don't, I have no idea. Right? And, uh, but, well, probably a local celebrity. So I'm guessing now, right? Uh, maybe maybe th this, is, this person is so and so and so and so. Right? So what's going on is that Jesus is, is popular, but popularity doesn't mean that you are familiar with him. Being popular, being, being famous doesn't mean you have a relationship with the person. So even if you know, oh, because him of his fame, because of his famous, but it doesn't automatically mean that you have a relationship now and you know the person now. Do you know what he likes? Do you know what he doesn't like? Do you know how he, you know, he, he, his... His purpose, his, his values in life. And if I don't know him in an intimate way, that now would be, it would come in that I would now have an, a guessing game, right? Well, this person might be this, or this person might be that. So what's, what's going on around here, uh, with this is that the story is, some people think that he's John the Baptist. And this, this was mentioned in Matthew chapter 14. And if you remember the story that King Herod had already put to death before Matthew 14, John the Baptist, he had beheaded John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was dead. And now Matthew chapter 14, uh, the story opens up with this, that at that time, Herod hears the news about Jesus. 
Herod starts to hear what Jesus has, is teaching through the people, what Jesus is doing, the, the, miracles, the miracles that he's been doing, and he says to his servants in verse 2 of chapter 14, this is a man whose conscience is stricken. He said, wait, wait, wait. That might be John the Baptist. He's come back from the dead. And, and, that's, and he has to explain right now because if he is hearing his ears correctly, Jesus was doing supernatural things. Jesus was healing those who, have, who are impossible to heal naturally. Jesus was doing things that no man could do. And so if, when Herod heard that, because he doesn't believe in Jesus, he hears about the fame of Jesus. He hears what Jesus is doing. Now his rational mind has to come up with a reason to make him believe or understand what Jesus is doing. So he said, wait, the only way that a man could do all of those things is if he is come back from the dead, meaning he's supernatural by himself. So his conclusion was, that must be John the Baptist. And so, that's the problem. It is not only the problem for the, the people during Jesus' time. We have people here. You, you tell them the story about Genesis 1, that God created everything, right? You, you tell them that Jesus in John 1 is described to be the Word existing for all eternity, that He is the Word come to flesh. And, and so the rational mind that would refuse to believe those words of God would have to come up with His own reason, with His own explanation. And so if I don't believe that God created the world because that's in the Bible and I don't believe in the Bible, I have to come up with my own explanation why the world is here. And so I'll come up with the Big Bang Theory. Well, I'll come up with what we are, we have come from, you know, an evolution, a chain, uh, a, a, a reaction of uh, evolution that we are now here, mutated now into who we are, right? I have to come up with all these reasons just so that I can explain away that Jesus, you're not who you are. You are John the Baptist. Now, some people now think that he is Elijah. And yeah, Elijah is, you know, if you rank the prophets, he's, he's way up there. He's one of the most popular prophets, one of the most beloved uh, prophets of Israel. And so, there's also this promise in Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 says, God gives a promise, right? It says, Behold, I send you Elijah before that great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So Jews believe that before there would be this, the, the, the day of the Lord would come, God would raise Elijah from the dead and Elijah would come back and be with his people so that they would be delivered. And, and that's why if they have the custom, the Passover meal, is that they would leave an empty chair on the table because that is for Elijah to remind them that Elijah is still going to come back. And Elijah is going to come to prepare the way for the Messiah, the promised one that would come. But there's a problem because Jesus has already said that he's not Elijah. That in fact, Elijah has come and it is John the Baptist. Matthew 11, verse 13 and 14. And you also can find that in Matthew 17, verse 12. I'll read Matthew 11, 13, and 14. It says, Jesus says this, For all the prophets of the law prophesied until John, John the Baptist. 
And if you are, get this, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah. Think about that. Jesus says, if you're willing to believe it, if you're willing to believe what I'm saying, if you're willing to accept this and believe this, Elijah has come. He is John the Baptist. He's so clear with that. Now, the only way I could keep on not, uh, that I would not believe that is if I would reject that notion. I'm not willing to accept that. And that's what some of the people that followed Jesus did. They said, we don't believe that you are the Messiah. So, but we have to find now another explanation that you could do those miracles, that you would have this authority, such authority uh, that we've never seen before. And so, you must be Elijah then, okay? You must be Elijah. And so, that's the, 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 the conclusion that they received for who Jesus is. Now, another group of people say that Jesus is Jeremiah. And you might wonder why, why Jeremiah and not Isaiah? Because Jesus quotes Isaiah. And Je Jeremiah, he wasn't the most popular or beloved prophet. A lot of people during Jeremiah's time hated him because his message was negative. His message was of doom. You guys, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we're doomed, right? Because we have, we have been so disobedient to God for so long, we're doomed. Our city is going to fall. Our nation is going to crumble. And, and so a lot of people did not like Jeremiah. They hated Jeremiah. So maybe some people who did not like Jesus during his time here. Or maybe some people thought that he was going to be, because there's a, an understanding from the Jewish writings that Jeremiah would, again, come back to life and would help deliver the people from a political oppressor. So, there, there could be two sides here. When people say, we believe that he's Jeremiah, they might mean he is, you know, he's going to deliver us from our political oppression. Or, they might mean, we don't like him. He's been breaking traditions. He's been a nuisance. Right? And we don't like his teachings. And it might come from admiration. It might come from hatred. But that's the problem. They still refuse to believe the words of Jesus Christ, of him saying who he is. And, and the fourth category, well, this would be the people that say, Lord, I mean, you're asking us, we don't care. He's just one of the prophets, right? So, this is generic, okay? Jesus, is, if there was a generic pharmacy, this would be it. Jesus is just a generic, right? Any, no brand, okay? Just name it, any prophet, uh, that could be it. I don't, I, I don't really care. All I want is his bread. All I want is what he gives me. I don't care who he is, okay? And, and that would be the, the attitude there of this fourth group of people that say, well, he's just one of the prophets. <laughs> Could be indifference. We just want something else from him. Once we get that, we're gone. We're out of here. But then Jesus turns to his disciples and asks them a personal question. Now, that's what they say. That's what other people say. But you... Who do you say I am? Now, if other people get it wrong, my prayer is that you do not get it wrong. Because this means your eternal life. Your eternity is at stake with this answer. Do you know who Jesus is? He is seeking worshipers 
that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. This matters to you and me. And so, here's what Simon replied. He says, Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's two, two reasons why you would use your full name or a narrator or a writer would use your full name, right? First is, when, when you hear your full name mentioned by your parents, your papa, your mama, you, you probably are in trouble, right? David, Haka, Chong, come here. <laughs> and, and so, if my full name is mentioned, I know I'm, I, I, there's something that, you know, I've got to pay attention. There, something's going to happen to me, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, you also use your full name for formal occasions. So, I think this is on the second reason. When Simon Peter Full name, Simon, Peter, answers Jesus. This is with formality here. This is not a, uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't think about my, my answer. I haven't thought about it. This is, we've thought about it, right? And this is Simon Peter now being the spokesperson again for the group of disciples. They're, they're, confer- they're, they're talking to each other. Oh, hey, guys, you got to get this right. Who do we say Jesus is, right? Now, they say, okay. This is what we believe, right? And now Simon Peter now speaks for the group of disciples. Jesus, we believe you are the Christ. That you could spend days and marvel at what this small group of people are now saying. When there are thousands of people who, have, who remain confused, when there are thousands of people that have seen the miracles with their own eyes, receive maybe the blessing of eating bread that, they, that Jesus had fed them with, and yet remain hard, remain in their unbelief in recognizing who Jesus is, Remain in their hatred. We hate Jesus for breaking our precious life and our tradition. They don't know and they don't recognize Jesus. This amazing statement right here, you are the Christ. That's loaded. That's loaded with grace and supernatural power of God at work in the lives of this man here. Because what he's saying is, Christ is the Greek equivalent of Messiah. And Messiah is the promised one, the anointed one. And so, when, when this is a statement of faith, of believing Jesus for who He is. Because Matthew is so careful and so precise. He puts it on the first verse of his book. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, he already says, Jesus is the Messiah, that the Messiah has come. But Jesus doesn't use the title. He uses the title, Son of Man. And and now, in chapter 16, he asks this group of disciples that he's journeyed with for two years, and it's so precious because remember what they've been go- they, they've gone through? A lot of their friends, a lot of the disciples that were following Jesus, meaning maybe for over a year now, they've journeyed with these people, these this disciples of Jesus. Remember one chapter before this or two? That many of the disciples of Jesus, when they heard Him say things that they could not 
take it they, that they found so offensive to them, they stopped following Him. They walked away from Jesus. So now those who are left, this is so precious because for them, they're saying, this is, this is we, what we believe, who you are. We're sure about this. We're now sure about this. If there were, we were doubting before, if we were confused before, we now are sure that you are the Christ. You are the promised Messiah. You're the one we've been longing for. You're the eternal king of this kingdom of heaven. You're the eternal savior. You're the only one who has the words of life. You are the bread of life. We have nowhere else to go. And so, he says, when Simon Peter says that, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll tell you why that's, that's not, that's a supernatural statement. It's heavy and loaded. You try, have you tried sharing the gospel to people? Have you tried explain, uh, sharing Jesus to your loved one, maybe? And have you discovered that it is not as simple as helping another person solve a math problem? See, with, with, with math problem, you would have this problem. Five plus five. Now, if I'm not, I don't know math, and I'm bad at math, I'd say, I tell you, well, five plus five, you put five, another five together, you get 55. So 55 is the answer. And, and so you, you're helping this person see the truth. And what you do is you'd open up a math, right? A math manual, right? This is the law of math, see? Five plus five cannot be 55. Five plus five must be 10. And it, 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 if that was... As, it was uh, explaining Jesus is just as easy as explaining math. Then, then when you now present the truth, this is who Jesus is. See, this is what the Bible says. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Jesus is the Word. He's existed before. He, he, he created. He was part of the creation. He is God. And, and when you present the, the law, the book, the word, and say, this is the truth. Have, it, have you discovered that people could still find a way to explain it away? Find a way to reject it? Find a way to say, That's, if you believe that, then I don't. But I don't. Let's just respect each other's different beliefs here. And so, you, you would discover that it's not as easy you now as appealing to their reason. It's not as, as easy as giving in to um, even a valid need. Have you tried helping people? Giving them basic needs? Because that's what Christians are supposed to do and we're helping them. But, and we're desiring that they should know Jesus. So we give, we, give a, we give them help, basic needs. And we're telling them that this is the love of God. Would you, would you like to love God? And then they would still find a way. Then they would say and reject. They would say, no, I just like that you love me. I just like that you care for me. I feel that, but I don't. Love this Jesus. I don't love back this Jesus that you say loves me. And so it's not just a simple matter of explaining to the mind and the reason. It's not just a simple matter of appealing to the heart. It's not just a simple matter of, of giving the person a very, a, what he's asking for, to, for help. That this would now make the person see Jesus for who he is. That this would now make the person love Jesus for who he is. 
So for a person to say, you are the Christ, something must have happened beyond reason, beyond an emotional tug or experience, something supernatural has happened here. The Bible describes a person who does not know Jesus as somebody that is dead, incapable, totally has no ability to believe and respond to Jesus or initiate anything to go to Jesus. The Word of God tells us that it is God who draws us near first so that we can draw near to Him. It is God who quickens somebody's dead heart that would now beat and there would just be this timely word. There would just be this tiny act of kindness that would kindle this person who was made alive by God and they would see now, wow, that's who you are, Jesus? That's how wonderful you are? That, my dear friends, is a supernatural statement right there because you could never do or say that naturally. You can never say it on your own. And so, when Jesus now, when, when Paul, uh, Peter now says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. You're the Messiah. You're, you're the promised one. You are God. Son of God is not, does not mean Jesus is below or inferior to God. Jesus is God. He is equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He is and, and we have one God. God is one. That's so important to understand. Here, O Israel, our God is one. And He is also God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit having the same essence. And our God is one. And they are distinct persons. Uh, this is what's displayed on the baptism of Jesus Christ. When, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus Christ, you hear the, 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 the God the Father speak. You, he, you see the Holy Spirit come down and you see Jesus Christ, God the Son, walking out from the water. That's who our God is. And, and, and if, you, if you refuse to, to believe and now can find a, a, a logical reason that would now be not coming from the revealed Word of God, but would be coming from who you want Jesus to be, who you want God to be, how you want Him to be. You would be repeating the mistake of the other people that tried to define who, God, who Jesus is in their own terms and in their own ways. You need to believe Jesus for who He really is in order to be saved. So they finally believe that Jesus is the only one who, say, who saves. 1 John 5.12 tells us, God has given us eternal life and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. First John 2, 23, No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son of the, has the Father also. So, you can't claim you know Him based on an idea, a popular notion, but you don't know who He really is. That's invalid before God who seeks worshipers to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so finally, if it is now impossible for me to believe on my own and I would need God's help, how do I do that? How do I, how do I ask for God's help so that I can believe 
and have the blessing of being saved by this wonderful Savior. Here's how Jesus said it himself. He said to Simon Peter, his response now to Simon Peter's declaration of faith. Blessed are you, son, Simon bar Jonah, son of John, son of Jonas, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. The only way for you to be able to say that statement of faith, to believe in Jesus, in the grace of God, and therefore have saving faith, is for have the source of faith give you that. And that is God. That's why Jesus says, it's not your flesh and blood. It's not your human effort. It's not your human mind. It's not your human heart that reasoned its way to heaven, that, that felt its way and loved its way to heaven. It's not, it's not your human hands that worked its way to heaven to believe in Jesus. No. It is God's grace that gives you the faith. He is the source. So if He is the source and we, are, we have no ability and capability, how you do it? Humble yourself. How you do it? You say, Lord, I am incapable. I, 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 have, I have no hope if you don't help me. Help me, Lord. I want to believe. Help me believe. And that by itself is already a prayer of faith. So, I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll illustrate to you with a story. A, a story of somebody that got, got transformed and why this is so important that for you to know who he is, that he's the son of God, the Messiah. And this is a story about a, a, somebody that, who has it all. He's got a great life, one of the best life, a blessed life. He's, he's rich. He's got a great education. And his name is Saul. He, he, has, he has the position. He has a wonderful career ahead of him. He might become high priest one day. His life is set. And he, he, he knows what he's doing. He's, he's a man of conviction. He's a man of principle. He knows and loves to do the right thing. So he's now killing people. He's now killing people who say they believe in Jesus. Because that's, a, that's, that's, not, that's not good. See, because Judaism is the only way. And so he's saying, Jesus, I don't believe in Jesus. And, and so he's putting to death these people. He's, he's throwing them to prison. Until he encounters the real Jesus. Not the, the version of Jesus that he thought he knew. Not the version of God that he, was, he thought he, he knew by heart and by, by mind. He encountered the real Jesus. And he realized how blind he was. On that road, he's blinded by light. He, he, he realizes that it is Jesus that he has been persecuting. The grace of Jesus helps him and, and directs him to Damascus where he meets a disciple of Jesus Christ who would now explain to him the gospel as well. And here, as, a, as somebody that had scales fall off his eyes, now he could see and he could hear. These are the first words he would utter. He says now, Jesus, I believe in Jesus. You are the Son of God. There will be no real conversion. There will be no real Christian if the Christian says or professes a different version of Jesus other than the Jesus in the Word. And so what did Paul do? He said he, was, he listened to the Word. He prayed and obeyed and, 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 and saw the revelation of the Father and that he could now see because God shone a, His light into his heart and mind. And Saul, who now became, becomes Paul, 
puts his faith in this grace of Jesus. And he believes. That's how you do it. And now the wonderful blessing. I started with this. A lot of people, they don't understand what, be, what being blessed is. So they think it's all just monetary, fin, uh, physical, worldly gains. God says, Jesus says to Simon here, blessed are you. Blessed are you, Simon. Simon received the greatest blessing when he put his faith in Jesus Christ. What is this blessing? Ephesians 1. Look it down. Hunt it down in your, in your, in your Bibles. Highlight it. Ephesians 1 says, says, says it this way. And you, and you, and you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. In Christ Jesus. The child of God who has now been saved by the grace of God and has now believed in Jesus Christ, the only one that could save, has now received all, and may that, I say that again, all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. That is what it means to be blessed. All of God's supernatural, wonderful promises are now yours. Today, if you're hearing this message, the Lord is inviting you and asking you this question. Who do you say? I am. Would you trust Him? Would you believe in Him? Would you believe in Jesus as He has revealed in His Word? Let's pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for this wonderful turning point in Matthew chapter 16, that we could see how patient you were, how gracious you were to this group of people, oh Lord, that without your mercy, without your saving work upon their lives, choosing them first, living with them, following with them, teaching them all so patiently, again and again, rebuking them at times, Reproaching them at times. We see how in this moment, they believed. And you said something so wonderful, Lord. That's so encouraging for all of us. And you said to them, blessed are they, because it is the Father who gives them that faith. So I'm asking, O oh Lord, for the people that are listening to this sermon this day, that that dynamics, O oh Lord, would be a reality for our life as well. That when you ask us the personal question, who do you say I am? I would be, I would be able to give a personal cry of faith, O oh Lord, and I'll say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I pray, Lord, that we will be able to be, you would bolden us to share this wonderful news, this gospel of Jesus Christ to others as well. I pray, Lord, that you would help us and even those who are not yet sure, who have been, who have had a different understanding of, of Jesus, I pray that this, you would use the word that they will hear, hear, O oh Lord, that they would now turn to you and trust you and only you, Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.